So this is where we were at the end last time, trying to decide when a high HOMO or a low LUMO is unusual in its energy. Because as the world is, things like to be in low energy. We'll talk about that later, why that's so. But that means that electrons tend to be in the occupied, the low, occupy the low energy orbitals, and not the high energy orbitals. So that empty orbitals are almost always higher than any occupied orbitals. So if you want to get good energy match, and therefore mixing, and therefore bonding, right? The occupied orbital that you're interested in must be unusually high, and the vacant orbital must be unusually low. So the task we have is to recognize what orbitals should be unusually high, and what ones should be unusually low, and if we can find the unusual ones, then we'll know what's reactive, be able to identify functional groups. Okay, so unusual compared to what? Compared to normal occupied and vacant orbitals. That is, in organic chemistry, or in most kinds of chemistry actually, carbon-carbon, uh, carbon-hydrogen bonds are occupied orbitals, not unusually high. They're our standard of usual. And the antibonds, corresponding antibonds, are unusual, are, are the usual uh, vacant orbitals. So what can make things unusually low or unusually high? When the valence shell orbitals, that if they bonded would go down and up, don't bond with anything, don't mix with anything, then they'll be unusual. Second, if the orbitals don't overlap, then they don't go down and go up. Third, if you have an unusual atomic orbital, these are made of carbon and hydrogen going down, but if you start with something that's unusual, unusually high or unusually low, then the things that come from it will be unusually high or unusually low. And finally, electrical charge. So right at the end last time, we were looking at the first example, unmixed valent shell atomic orbitals. So we saw that the simplest of all acids, H+, of course, is unusually, it would be, if it were occupied, it would be unusually high for an occupied orbital, right? Because it hasn't gone down. But it's vacant, and it's unusually low for a vacant orbital because it hasn't gone up. And so on with these others, an unshared pair on nitrogen, or a little less so on oxygen. Uh, a vacant orbital on boron that's not bonding with anything is an unusually low LUMO. Even though orbitals on boron are not unusually low, because the nuclear charge isn't very big for something that's using a, a, a second n equals two quantum level orbitals, valence orbitals. It's an unusually low char nuclear charge for that. So the orbitals are unusually low, uh, uh, pardon me, are unusually high in energy, not being attracted by more protons. But it's low for a vacant orbital if it hasn't mixed with anything. Okay, and finally, notice that some of these are charged. H plus, plus means that's a good place to put an electron, right? So unusually low. Uh, oh, pardon me, OH minus, unusually high because of the negative charge. CH3 minus, especially high. So this slide also shows the fourth point, that electrical charge makes a difference on the, how normal occupied and vacant orbitals are. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so these unusually low vacant orbitals are acids, like H+. Plus. Unusually high occupied orbitals are bases, like OH-, as we just showed on the previous slide. That means that you can mix the high HOMO of OH- minus with the low LUMO of H+, plus, and two electrons, the ones that were on the OH-, minus, go down in energy, and that makes a bond. And our notation for showing that is to draw a curved arrow and it gives water. Now, think carefully about what a curved arrow means. It's not the same as a straight arrow. A curved arrow designates a shift of electron pairs. It doesn't show that this atom moves from here to here. It shows that a pair of electrons shifts, and that pair of electrons goes from being on the oxygen to being between oxygen and hydrogen to form the bond. So you start the curved arrow where the electron pair is at the beginning, 
and you end the arrow, put its point where it's going to be in the product. Right? So it's not showing that an atom moves from here to there. It's showing that the electrons that were formerly on oxygen are now between oxygen and hydrogen. The effect of that is, of course, to pull the hydrogen to the oxygen. But that's not what's being shown by the arrow. What's being shown by the arrow is how the electrons are moving in our picture. Okay, so there's a case. Now here's another base with the same acid. And we draw a curved arrow there and show making an ammonium ion out of ammonia. Or we could use the same base with a different acid, the low vacant orbital of BH3, and draw the same curved arrow and make this anion make the boron oxygen bond. Or we could start with completely different ones. We could start with ammonia, not OH minus, not Arrhenius's acid, Arrhenius's base, but ammonia, not Arrhenius acid, H plus, but BH3. But it's exactly the same reaction. The high homo mixes with the low lumo to form a new bond. Okay, so that's what curved arrows show. And don't confuse it by trying to draw molecules or atoms moving and showing a curved arrow. If you want to show them moving, draw some other kind of arrow. Draw a dotted arrows or a straight arrow or a wiggly arrow or something. But the curved arrows have a very specific meaning. <coughs> now, the, the second uh, reason that things can be unusually high or low is because they don't have no, much overlap. Notice in the first case, it was just an extreme case of that. There was no overlap at all. The orbitals were just there. But even though the orbitals are mixed with something else, if the overlap is poor, they haven't changed very much. They still look very much like they did originally, right? So a good example of not having very good overlap is the side-to-side -side overlap of p orbitals. The pi overlap, you remember from looking at those curves of amount of overlap for different orbitals versus distance, the pi overlap isn't very big. So even though the uh, the p orbitals start a little higher on carbon than they do on, uh, 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 on hydrogen or, or normal bonds of carbon that have s character in them. They start a little higher, but they don't mix very much. Right? So the, the pi orbital is unusually high. And the pi star antibonding orbital is unusually low because they didn't go down or up very much. Okay? Now, which of those do you think is more remarkable in its highness or lowness? Which do you think? So for this reason, the carbon-carbon double bond could behave either as an acid or as a base. Right? High occupied orbital makes it a base. Low vacant orbital makes it an acid. And indeed, it does have both kinds of reactivity. But which do you think is more pronounced? Which would be more familiar? How high the occupied one is or how low the vacant one is? Lucas, what do you say? How low the vacant one is. And why do you say so? Because electrons have to absorb. They would like to move into a position of an energy as close as possible to it. Yeah, but on the other hand, the electrons of the pi want to move into something else. There are lots and lots and lots of electrons. Oh, no. Well, there are, lots, there are even more vacant orbitals than there are electrons, right? Because you also have starring electrons that will, uh, like in a normal carbon atom. Let's just look at the picture. Yeah, Catherine? Um, I think the homo is more unusual because it's farther away from the usual homo. Ah, the homo is further above the normal bonds than the lumo is below the normal antibonds. Why? Can't hear very well. Because the p orbitals started a little. Ah, because they started a little higher. Right. So most reactions that we'll study, or at least many reactions that we'll study of the carbon-carbon double bond, it's reactive because of the high homo, not because of the low lumo. Although there are cases where the low lumo makes it reactive, but it's this pi orbital here that makes it particularly remarkable because they started a little high. Okay, so the high homo makes it unusually reactive. Now, how about the CO double bond, right? So it starts with the same p orbital on the carbon, 
which has pi overlap, therefore not much shifting up and down, with a p orbital of oxygen, which of course is lower than that of carbon because of the higher nuclear charge. Which of these will be most unusual? Somebody got a suggestion? So what would you think the characteristic reactivity of a CO double bond? Would it be reactive mostly as a high homo, that is as a base, or mostly as a low lumo, which is more unusual compared to what we compare things with? Andrew? It's a low lumo. Why? Because, well, again, it's further away from each other. And why is it further down? compared to what we usually compare. Why does the pi star C double bond O, why, does, why is that orbital so very low? One reason, pardon me, one reason it's low is because the overlap isn't very much, so it didn't go up so much, right? That's the same true with the CC double bond. But what's special about the CO double bond, Andrew? I thought the atoms are different. There's a because of the bad energy match, right? It didn't go up very much from the carbon or down very much from the oxygen, but the average is low that it starts from. So it's un what's special here is the, 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 the pi is not so unusual, not so far from here, but this one, <coughs> pi star, is very far from here. So what should make a carbonyl uh, especially reactive is its low vacant orbital because of poor overlap and that it started with an oxygen, an unusually low orbital, atomic orbital. Okay. We saw another example here. This three-membered carbon ring is unusually reactive for a carbon-carbon bond. That is, the electrons in that carbon-carbon bond are not shifted down so much, and the Antibond is not shifted up so much as in normal carbon-carbon bonds. Why? What's special about the bonds in the three-membered ring? Kevin? Well, uh, two of them are, are bent. Ah, they're bent. And what does that mean? This is greater than 90 degrees. Yeah, yeah but, but they're so bent, they so what? Overlap, so what? Overlap. It doesn't overlap as well, so it doesn't go up and down as much, right? So another example of poor overlap. Okay, or you could have an unusual atomic energy orbital in the molecular orbital. For example, how about a CF single bond, right? So the overlap can be perfectly good. It's a regular old sigma bond straight on, right? <laughs> but the fluorine starts very low. There's bad energy match. So the pi star isn't so very different from a vacant orbital on carbon, unusually low as a vacant orbital. So it should act as an acid. Things that have high homos should come up and react with, with that uh, uh, sigma star of CF. It's an unusually low LUMO. Can you think of what the flip side of that? How could you have something like this, a carbon <laughs> bonding to something, that for the same or analogous reason would have an unusually high occupied orbital? What would you want the carbon to bond with? Choose an element. Lithium. lithium. Why lithium? Because, because you looked at the PowerPoint? <laughs> <laughs> Why lithium? Why? Because it would be stable as a lithium plus one ion. Why? <laughs> because That's restating the same thing, right? What's different about lithium? Why are orbitals on lithium as an atom unusually high in energy compared to carbon hydrogen? Catherine? because it has a low nuclear charge, right? It's right at the left end of the table, okay? So it does, its orbitals aren't very stable because it doesn't have very low, very high nuclear charge. 
so it's a high energy and, that, and therefore it has bad energy match or it could have been lithium that I drew here. I happen to draw boron, which is for the same reason, a lower nuclear charge than carbon, therefore higher energy is an atomic orbital. When they mix, what's special here is the occupied orbital, sigma, right, which is unusually high because the average started high. Okay, so we, so boron, you may remember that in the first slide we showed, boron had a vacant orbital, right, that p orbital on boron is vacant, unusually low, therefore what, acid or base? Unusually low vacant orbital, which does that make it? Acid, so BH3 should be an acid, right? But what I just showed you is what, Shai? That, um, On the previous the, slide, we'll go BH, back to yeah, the BH. It has an unusually high homo BH3. So what does that make it, Shai? Would make it a base, but. So is it an acid or a base? Both. Wilson? Both. It's both. And what does that suggest? If the same molecule is both an acid and a base, What do acids react with? So what if the same molecule is an acid and a base? It's going to react with itself. Two of the molecules will react with one another. Okay, and that's why you can't do a crystal structure of BH3. Because BH3 becomes B2H6. Let's look at how it happens. So there's the low LUMO that makes BH3 an acid. What's the high HOMO? What's the high homo of BH3? In localized terms, I don't mean these uh, big things that go over the whole molecule. It's the BH bond, right, which was poorly matched in energy and so on. So there, it's notice that the BH bonding electrons are big on hydrogen, small on boron. We saw that last lecture, okay? So they should overlap like this, right? And the vacant orbital on BH3 should stabilize, or the, the vacant orbital on the B should stabilize <laughs> these high energy electrons in the BH bond. But now, you could imagine many different orientations of the top molecule that would allow overlap. Do you know why I chose this particular orientation? Which one acted as the acid and which one is the base? The one on the bottom, the vacant orbital, acted as an acid. The one on the top acted as a base. So what other possibility is there? Yunju? Um, it, so then there also is, you could reverse the role. Aha, uh -huh, you could have, so that would make, notice incidentally, what I forgot to mention here, is that there are three nuclei being held together by that pair of electrons now. Originally, the top molecule, that pair of electrons, mostly on hydrogen but partly on boron, held the hydrogen and the boron together. Now that same pair of electrons is attracted, is, is, is helping form a bond with a boron, the bottom boron. So in fact, that's an unusual kind of bond because it's bonding three nuclei together, not just two. It's doing double or perhaps triple duty. So we need a new symbol to talk about such bonds. And a reasonable one would be a bond that looks like that. It's a Y bond. We can make it blue. Okay. But now we have, as Yunju said, the vacant orbital on the top and the high occupied orbital on the bottom. And they can do exactly the same thing. So we have two of these three center, two electron <laughs> bonds, right? Two electrons holding three atoms together, right? Or we can draw it that way, right? And that's the structure of B2H6. Two of the pairs of electrons are each bonding three atoms together instead of two. Any questions about this? Yeah, Allison? 
Yeah, the dotted just means it's a little different. You could draw the solid Y if you want to. There's no really standard notation for that. But it's clear what it means. It's just that a pair of electrons is being shared among three nuclei rather than two, and their electron density is correspondingly, if you did a difference density map, map if you could do an X-ray of this, you'd expect electron density to build up in the middle of all three. Yeah, Claire? This may seem like a stupid question, but a high homo we've talked about as a base, and a low lumo we've talked about as an acid. Yeah. And the low lumo is unoccupied, so it's, I mean, if you think about it like this, it's sort of receiving electrons. Right. But generally, bases are supposed to receive electrons instead of acids. And no, you got it backwards. Do I? Yeah. Because H plus is an acid, right? right? So it obviously can't give up electrons. There aren't any electrons. An acid accepts electrons. Okay? Think about it a little bit in the privacy of your room and you'll see that. Okay? Does the bond between three nuclei only happen in I can't hear very well. Does the bond between the three nuclei only happen here because of the geometry of the molecule? Yeah, and they, to, get, to get that, you have to have overlap. So if you didn't have, if that top, if, if the top BH3 were oriented so that the BH bond were vertical and the boron was way up at the top, it wouldn't overlap the other one. So you have to, you always to get a bond, you have to have overlap, because otherwise the orbitals don't mix and you just have the original orbitals as we've seen. Is this kind of bond very common? Pardon me? Is this kind of bond very common? No, it's not very common because there are not many vacant or lo really low energy vacant orbitals running around, right? Boron is a very special case, but you, a lithium can do the same thing. But lithium doesn't have energy, orbital energies as low as those of boron because it doesn't have as big a nuclear charge. So boron is particularly good at getting this kind of thing. And this answers the puzzle about Lewis structures that we raised in lecture two about what, how can BH3 react with BH3, right? That's how it does it, by making three center bonds. Now, here's a true and false quiz. On the basis of what you know, is it true that low energy molecular orbitals result in bonding? True or false? I don't think you trust me anymore. <laughs> We've been saying that when you get those low orbitals, right, things come together, you get a low orbital, that results in a bond. Lots of overlap. I can't talk you into it? Good. That's false. What makes a bond is lowered energy orbitals. It's when things come together and the electrons get more stable. It's not how low they are, it's how much they're lowered by the coming together, because then pulling apart, they have to go back up again. So it's not whether they're high or low, it's whether they get lowered, okay? Now, compared to what? What do they have to get lower compared to? By themselves. Yunju? You can say it's something in fewer words than that. Yeah. What do you compare to? When you say energy is lowered, and that makes a bond, what's it lowered compared to? The Christopher? The atoms in their standard states. Uh, the at well, yes, but it, could, it wouldn't necessarily be between atoms. It could be between two molecules, like BH3 with BH3. What it's, but you're right. What it's lowered compared to is the things it was before they came together, right? Now these things before they came together, one of them had electrons, one didn't. Those might have been very high, right? So they came together, the electrons went substantially down, but still aren't so very low. They could have been very low energy orbitals to begin with, but not gone down very much, okay? Because there was bad overlap, say. So these, even though they're lower than the ones we talked about first, would not be so bonding. It's these that were bonding because they came down a lot when the mixing happened. So it's lowering compared to what? Compared to the separated components before you made this bond, right? 
So when things come together and that results in the electrons going way down in energy, that's a strong bond. Yes, How Jen, you? Pardon me? How far does it have to go down? Well, that's what we're going to have to learn. That's a question of lore, right? And it has to be at least enough to overcome the fact that when they come together, other electrons, other orbitals, are, filled orbitals are overlapping, which is net repulsive. So it may not be that there's an absolute criterion, right? It may be that if there are a lot of other things opposing the coming together, filled orbital with filled orbital, then you have to have really enormous going down. So it, you can't make a simple, quest, simple answer to that. But we're, we'll learn as we see examples. OK. So now, homo-lumo mixing for reactivity and resonance. So reactivity means between molecules. So far, we've been talking mostly about atoms coming together and forming a bond. But molecules have high orbitals and low orbitals, as in the case of BH3. The BH was a, was a molecular <laughs> orbital, or a, not an atomic orbital, right? So when things come together, orbitals are orbitals. If you have an unusually high energy and an unusually low energy, and they overlap and go down, that makes a bond. So that's between molecules. But it turns out that what resonance is, is homo-lumo mixing within a molecule. Now, you might say, the molecules have certain molecular orbitals. How can you mix them, right? The idea is that we made our first analysis on the basis of localized orbitals, sigma, sigma star here, sigma, sigma star here, not these big clodney things that go over the whole thing. But it may be that this sigma, sigma star and this sigma, sigma star are near one another and overlap. So that when we made our initial analysis, and looked only at this and only with this, we didn't take into account that this one might interact with this one and give still lower energy. When that kind of thing is important, that's when you have to draw other resonance structures. And I'll show you an example. But first, I'm going to show you reactivity, and then we'll go on to resonance. OK, now let's look at the frontier orbitals for HF. Okay, So it has four valence electron pairs and five valence atomic orbitals, 2s, 2p, x, y, z on, fluor on fluorine, and a 1s on hydrogen, and, and four pairs of electrons. So there are going to be four occupied orbitals, and these are what the, this is what the lowest orbital looks like. What, is it, what does it look like? Well, it's a 2s orbital, the 1s being the core on fluorine. But it's made up of atomic orbitals. Is it exactly a 2s of fluorine? Does it look like a sphere on fluorine? Allison, you're shaking your head. And how did it get a little distorted? What did we mix with the f orbital? A little bit of the 1s on hydrogen. It's mostly the f on fluorine. Why? Because the fluorine's way down in energy, so the best combination is mostly this. But you can see that it's a little bit egg-shaped, a little bit drawn out toward the hydrogen. Okay, so it's mostly a 2s of, or of fluorine, but a little bit of 1s on hydrogen. Right? Now here's the next one. What's that mostly? Can you see? Tyler, what do you say? It looks like a 2p on fluorine. Does it look exactly like a 2p on fluorine, or is it just hard for you to see that it's not? It's very similar. I don't know, but it's pretty close, but the blue one might be a bit bigger. Yeah, the blue one is a little bit bigger because it's got a little bit of the 1s of hydrogen lowering the energy of the 2p of fluorine. Okay? And now the next two orbitals are these. What are those? Steve, what do you say? <laughs> They're the 2PY and 2PZ of fluorine. Do they make, do, why, is there hydrogen in those two? Why not? Because they don't overlap with the one as Ah, they're orthogonal. It's a pi versus a sigma. There's no overlap, therefore no mixing. So those are the occupied orbitals, and the 2Ps have the same energy. Okay, and then, remember, there are going to be five molecular orbitals. And now you make the last one 
which is going to have another node with the leftovers. What's left over after we made the occupied orbitals? <coughs> What's it mostly left over? We used up the two P's of fluorine to make those homos. Those were pure, right? But what was left over from, from the bottom? The, we did, used very little of 1S on hydrogen. And there's a little bit of 2P fluorine and 2S fluorine that we didn't use in the bottom ones. So they're back in the top. So what we have is mostly a 1S on hydrogen, but a little bit of some kind of SP hybrid on fluorine. Is that clear to everyone? So that's the, that's the vacant orbital. Is it unusual energy, that vacant orbital? It's, it's low. Is it unusually low? Kate, do you have an idea? <coughs> what kind of criteria do we have for whether an orbital should be unusually low? What do we look for? Overlap, energy match. How about this case? Good overlap? Quite good overlap. It's a, a hybrid orbital on fluorine pointing right toward a hydrogen. Good overlap. How about the energy match? Okay. Um, sure. Sure what? Sure it's good or sure it's bad? One of them's hydrogen. What's the other one? Where's fluorine compared to hydrogen? Why? As nuclear charge. Right. Okay. Good energy match or bad energy match? Not great. Not very good. So you don't get much mixing. And you know that already by looking at the picture because you didn't mix it very much. It's almost all 1s of hydrogen. So it's unusually low for a sigma star. It didn't go up very much from hydrogen. So indeed, now it's got an unusually low vacant orbital. What does that make it? An acid or a base? It's an acid. Are you surprised that HF is an acid? Why? What's its name? Uh, Hydrofluoric acid. acid. And that's what makes it an acid. Arrhenius would say it's an acid because it gives up H+. We say it's an acid because it's an unusually low vacant orbital. Right? Now, here, uh, so notice that those three are made up of three atomic orbitals, the 1s of hydrogen, the 2s of fluorine, and the 2p, a 2p orbital of fluorine. And they're in different mixtures in three of these. Usually we've looked at just two things, right? There's one atom, atomic orbital, and another one. And they mix, right, a pair. Here there are three going in to give three molecular orbitals. But still you can see quite easily why they should be the way they are, why the bottom ones are almost pure fluorine, and the top one is almost pure hydrogen. Uh, okay, and so that top one is sigma star, the LUMO, the unusually low LUMO. Lucas? How can we be sure that the 1s of like a low nuclear charge hydrogen is going to be that much different from like the really high nuclear charge 2s of fluorine? Yeah, this you have to learn, and I'm going to show you very soon how we can tell that kind of thing. Okay, there's a different picture that was made in 1973 of the same thing. These pictures were drawn just a year or two ago, right? But this, this is, you can see the same thing. It's drawn at a different contour level. It was based on a different calculation. But you can see it's the same thing. And we'll notice that, how many nodes does this thing have that are clearly visible? Two nodes, right, between the H and F. That one is anti-bonding, right? When they came together, they canceled in the middle rather than reinforcing. There's another node there. But notice that that didn't have anything to do with the bonding. That was already there in the atomic orbital you started with. So it didn't have anything to do with lowering. It didn't have anything to do with whether the thing was bonding or antibonding. The pink node had to do with whether it was bonding. That came when they came together. Right? It's, an unfav it's unfavorable, so it's better for them to come apart. But if they come apart, you don't do anything with the blue node. It's still there. It's part of the atom. Okay? So you have to recognize that there are two kinds of nodes. There are nodes that were there already, atomic orbital nodes, and there are ones that are associated with the coming together. And that's what makes something bonding or antibonding. 
in this particular case, it's antibonding. Okay, now let's look instead of HF, let's look at CH3F. Sam? Why is it frontier? Because you have occupied orbitals and then you have vacant orbitals. And the ones you're interested in are the lowest of the vacant and the highest of the occupied at this border between occupied and vacant orbitals. Okay, so this one has seven valence pairs of electrons. So you're going to occupy seven orbitals. And here's what they look like, the seven that are occupied. What's the very lowest one? Mostly. It's the 2S of fluorine, right? And what's the next one? Well, it's CH bonds all mixed together, right? But also a little bit of a P orbital on fluorine. It has the, the blue sort of toward the front and a little bit of that red behind as part of the P orbital on fluorine. So it's a mixture of the CH bonds and of the, uh, of the P orbital on fluorine. And then we have these others, some of them coming in pairs. And those are the homos because we have seven occupied. And let's look at them a little more closely and compare them with each one with the one beneath it. And I'll draw another picture too for, of that older kind for making this comparison. And we're interested in what is it that went together to make these orbitals and why is one lower in energy and the other higher? So what do you see on the top orbital, say, this one here, the top left? What's that made up of? What is it on the left side? Sophie, what would you say the orbital is on the left side of that? Right, this part here is a 2p pi, right, orbital of fluorine. Now what's this thing on the right here, the dashed bit down here? If you just saw that without any of the rest of it, what would you say that was? It's more, it's more than a 1s on hydrogen, that would be spherical. It's at a certain contour, the CH bond. Do you see that? So this is, this is electron density in here bonding between C and H. And these two on the top are little bits of CH bonds as well, mixed together. So what this orbital is, is a mixture between some combination of CH bonds on the right and the P orbital of fluorine on the left. Now, is it a favorable or an unfavorable combination of the fluorine orbital with the CH orbitals? This one up here. Is the interaction between the fluorine orbital and the CH orbitals bonding or antibonding? Yeah. Becky, do you have an idea? Are they building up electron density in between or having a node in between? There's a node in between, so that's anti-bonding. What's the orbital on the bottom? This one. That's the same components, but it's the bonding combination. So this is the favorable combination of those, and this is their unfavorable combination. So this lower energy one is favorable, and the upper energy is unfavorable combination. How about here and here? Can you see what that is? What's on the left here? That, that, that lump of red and this lump of blue. Eric? Here, here and this thing is made, it's, a compli it's very complicated, okay? Will you agree on that? Okay. But part of it is part on the left. There's a red lump in behind and a blue lump in front. You can see it maybe more clearly here red behind and blue in front, surrounding the green fluorine atom. What is that orbital, that atomic orbital? Can't hear very well. It's the p orbital on fluorine that's pointing more or less toward you, okay? So this is the p orbital of fluorine that's mixing with CH bonds here, right? In fact, it's the same thing as this turned on its side. Okay, so this is the bonding combination built up between the fluorine and the CHs. This is the antibonding one with a node between the fluorine and the CHs. 
So here we have a node in this bottom one, but that node came from the atomic orbitals. That's what made it a p orbital here on fluorine. That one you don't get rid of if you pull the fluorine away. That doesn't have anything to do with the bonding. That's just an atomic orbital node, right? On the top, you again have the same atomic orbital node because it's the same p orbital that's involved. But what about the top? Sam? You have another node. There's another node, that one, and that's an anti-bonding node, right? The electrons in that orbital would get uh, lower in energy if, the, if you broke the bond, if the fluorine came away. So the pink nodes are the ones we're interested in, the anti-bonding nodes, not the ones that are just part of the atomic orbital. Okay, now uh, we're getting to Lucas's question. So this thing down here is made up of fluorine and CH. The one here is made up of fluorine and CH. Right? This is the favorable combination and this is the unfavorable combination. So get it right. So here are the two of them. They come together when the F comes up to the methyl, right? And you get a favorable one and an unfavorable one. But the fluorine and the CHs may not be at the same energy. How do you know which one's lower? That's your question. Is the fluorine lower or is the CH lower? Or are they about the same? Now, how are we going to tell? If the fluorine is lower and they come together, what does the lower one look like, mostly? Fluorine. If the fluorine's higher and they come together, what does the low one look like? Mostly CH, right? So by looking at how big these are, we can tell which one is lower. So when we look here, uh, we, uh, we we see that here, the, I would say they're, they're pretty similar left to right. There's not much difference between a 2p orbital on fluorine and CH sigma bonds, not much difference. But to the extent they're different, I would say, looking at this, that the CH is a little bigger here and the fluorine is a little bigger here. Would you say that? So which is lower, a CH sigma bond or the p orbital of fluorine? CH sigma bond would be a little lower than fluorine. Not much though, pretty similar. So they're about the same, as we say, but if you have to make a choice, the CH is a little bit lower in energy. The fluorine's a little higher. Okay. Uh, now, there's also a vacant orbital made up with the leftovers here, some of the leftovers. And what's that? Let's look at a different picture of it. So this has three nodes that are obvious. There's one that's near the fluorine atom, a node plane that goes back, the furthest to the left. Everyone see that? Is that an bo anti-bonding node or is that an atomic orbital node? That's part of the fluorine atomic orbital. It's of some hybrid on fluorine, right? And the same is true at the CH end. There's a node that's an atomic orbital node of the carbon, right? But what's important? Between those other two is what's between the fluorine and the carbon and the CH3, and that's antibonding. So that, that LUMO is a sigma star antibond between C and methyl. And why is it unusually low? The question is whether the LUMO should be unusually low. Why is it unusually low? Is the overlap bad? No, the overlap's good. The hybrid's pointing right toward one another. But what, what makes it low in energy? So, you know, I, I'm not giving you specific problems on this, but look over those things and run your brain as to those four different things that make orbitals unusually high or unusually low, because that's what you'll be doing next week when you're doing these wikis, each of you, to decide some functional group, why is it functional? What makes it unusually high or unusually low? Or maybe neither, right? Why is the CF bond, more properly, the CF sigma star orbital, the antibonding orbital, why is it unusually low? 
Compared to what? What do you compare to? A CH bond. How, how come CF is lower for the sigma star? Alex? Pardon me? Yeah, the fluorine is really low. Their average is very low. So the vacant orbital is unusually low. It didn't go up much. Right? Where have you seen that before? HF. The previous slide, HF, was exactly the same. It's an acid. Remember, Kate, you helped us with that. It's an acid because of the bad energy match between fluorine and hydrogen. This is the same thing, but it's the bad energy match between fluorine and carbon. Okay? So CH, CH3F is an acid for the same reason that HF is an acid. Right? There's the low LUMO of HF, right? It's got that same anti-bonding node. Shy? Why is there um, no energy mismatch between carbon and hydrogen? It just happens that it worked out that way. No, it's, it's true. Uh, hydrogen is 1s. That makes it unusually low, but it doesn't have very big nuclear charge. Carbon has a higher nuclear charge, but you're talking 2s and 2p. And it turns out those just cancel out. If that hadn't been the case, organic chemistry, like if, if boron happened to match hydrogen, then maybe our organic chemistry would be, would be boron hydrogen, not carb, there would be borohydrates, not carbohydrates, right? But that's the way things are. So in this picture we can tell that... Actually, there are other reasons it wouldn't be boron, because boron has these vacant orbitals and forms B2H6 and so on. But it just happens that that cancellation works that way. Lucas? So just by looking at this picture, we can say that uh, CH3, that there's poor energy match because the orbitals around fluorine are much smaller than those around uh, uh, Let's look at, look at the next slide here. Uh, is it this one? No, we're going to get to that. If you looked at ones that were very badly mismatched, then the favorable and unfavorable combinations would be very dramatic. And we, actually, you've already seen that in HF. Okay, uh, we have one minute to start this. Okay, so we're going to look at how CH3F behaves like HF, right? Both of them are acids. So first we'll look at HF, and next time we'll go on to CH3F. So here's, here's HF. So you have to bring, here's a va low vacant orbital. We've talked about that ad nauseum, okay? Now you want to get good overlap. From what direction will another orbital come in order to get good overlap without the nuclei getting too close together? Obviously it'll come from off in the right where this orbital is big, where you can get a lot of overlap without getting close to the nuclei. So if you had something with a high energy pair of electrons, it would come and it would overlap from the right something like OH minus. And you draw a curved arrow to show those electrons, the high HOMO of OH minus, being stabilized by the vacant orbital of HF. And how would you draw the curved arrow? Where would it start? Where would it end? To show the electrons of OH minus forming a bond with the OH bond. You'd start from the pair of electrons that you're talking about, and you'd end between H and O, right? But that means, this is really important, that means you're putting electrons, putting electron density into this orbital, right? What effect does putting electrons in that orbital have on the HF bond? Okay, the curved arrows, blah, blah, we did that. Sherwin? It's like it pushes the It's what? What do you call that orbital? What's the name of the orbital that we're putting electrons into? It's sigma star. It's mostly 1s on hydrogen, but it's sigma star. What does star mean? What does it mean if you put electrons in? The bond will break, right? It has that anti bonding node. So electrons that go into that will get more stable if the bond breaks. So we're going to draw another curved arrow like that. So we make a new bond between H and O, but we lose the bond between H and F. So there's our product. That's an acid-base reaction, 
and it showed HF acting as an acid. Not because it gave H plus. H plus never appears in here. Right? What happened is you make a bond and break a bond to the hydrogen. So it's an acid-base reaction. And the same thing we'll show next time happens with CH3F. Okay. <laughs>